heard this story before. There's a, there's a minister, uh, he was uh, driving down the road, and then he was stopped for speeding. Okay? And then the, uh, the, the state trooper, well, the, the police, the policeman, right? the state trooper, right? The traffic police, um, stopped the car, uh, obviously stopped for speeding, and he can smell alcohol on the minister's breath. Wow. And he saw an empty wine bottle on the floor. And he asked, Sir, you know, you can imagine, right, with a stern face, have you been drinking? And then the minister, the pastor, I mean, the pastor says, No, I'm, I'm, I'm just water. But why do I smell wine? Don't you lie to me? No, I just, I just drink water. This is, this is a water bottle. Oh, oops. It's why I guess Jesus he has done it again. <laughs> Did you get the joke? I mean, you know, Jesus turned water into wine. Right? Okay, <laughs> so uh, uh, it is it is it's, it's it's one thing to lie, right? Obviously, but it is another to live in lies, right? One thing to tell a lie, but it's another matter if you live in a lie. You know, but but some people prefer to live in a lie because lie can make life easy, right? Lie can make life easier. There is no God. Jesus is just uh, one way. God exists to make you happy. All of these things. If you live living this, you might feel fine. You might feel fine. But are you fine? Right? That's the question. You might feel fine, but are you really fine? Will you be truly okay? You all know that trusting the wrong news is dangerous, right? Imagine betting your life on a hoax, like what I shared last week. Trusting the wrong news is dangerous. And you don't want it. You don't want to live in a lie. You don't want to live in an illusion. But trusting in a false gospel, there's been that all the wrong messages that we've been hearing is it's that we can hear. We can hear all along our society and we trust the false gospel. It's not just dangerous, it's not just living in a lie. When you trust in the wrong gospel, my brothers and sisters in Christ, it's actually damning. It actually has eternal consequences. And today we want to see uh, how we can look how we can escape or how we can must be aware of this false gospel. Let's open our Bibles to Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 to 10. Okay? Let's read together. I have it in my slide. Um, I'm always <coughs> using the ESV, by the way, uh, for those who you know, because it's uh, Edo's standard version. <laughs> no, just, <laughs> just kidding. English standard version, okay? Uh, the, this is the ESV, okay? Uh, let's let's read uh, together. Uh, well, okay, uh, all five verses should be fine, right? Okay, uh, Galatians, if you want to open your Bible, it's fine too. This is Galatians 1, 6 to 10, 3, 2, 1. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning into a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we are or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, and now I say it again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I will not be servant of Christ. Amen. Amen. This is Paul speaking to us through the letter of Galatians. So Paul, brothers and sisters, he was called the apostle to the Gentiles. That means he built churches amongst the non-Jews. Okay? Non-Jews. So he established many churches and one of them is the church in Galatia. Galatia? Yeah. Uh, Galatia, kalau bahasa kita, Galatia. So, obviously inside this church, probably, mainly, dominantly, the members are Gentiles. That's the technical term for non-Jews, okay? Most of them are Gentiles. Now, 
So Paul, after he established the church, because he's a church planter, usually he doesn't stay very long in one place. He goes to another group and another church. So when he left, another group of Christians came in. This is a group of Jewish Christians. Okay? And they began to visit all of the churches that Paul has established. Now, they, when they, when they came into the church in Galatia, they, they were, Paul called them the agitators. Apa ya? Pag-usak ya? Agitator. <laughs> the agitators. Uh, some word please. <laughs> Mangleta. Mangleta, you know? Agitators, you know? Mangangu, mangangu, mangangu. So these agitators, basically, they want the Gentile believers to live by the Mosaic law. And especially, they want them to, to accept circumcision. Okay? So basically, they're saying is this. You know, folks, I, it's, it's a nice church. You know, I'm, I'm praise the Lord. You, you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior. You no longer worship Zeus, whoever. But you have not become a full Christian yet. In order to be a full Christian, they would say, faith alone is not enough. In order to be saved, you have to add the Jewish way of life. You have to look like us, eat like us, and everything else just like the Jewish people. So that's basically the context, and that's where we're going to see. So in this five verses, we're going to see three and learn three things. First, the danger of false gospel. Second, the symptom of false gospel. And finally, the cure towards or of false gospel. Okay, the danger, the symptom, the cure of false gospel. Let's look at verse 6 and 7. Paul says, I am astonished right, that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Notice, Paul's charge is not, how dare you turn from me? Paul's charge is not, how dare you turn from the gospel that I preach this is the Holy Bible. But he says what? How dare you turn from who? From God himself. How dare you, you back away or you desert the God who has called you in grace. So brothers and sisters, in responding to the gospel, we are reporting to God himself. We are in the, you know, we are reporting to the big man <laughs> himself. See, this is important because many things, Christians, we can disagree, right? Banyak hal yang kita bisa tidak setuju. The way we organize our church, what style of music to use, whether we baptize infants or adults, whether Jesus will come and set up 1,000 years of you know kingdom on earth, whether you know, we will be raptured and you know all suddenly you are all gone. You know we can disagree on that, I think. But one thing that we must affirm together without fail, the non-negotiable part of our faith is the gospel. Because if you turn from that, you are turning from God Himself. See, the point is this, church. We must not exaggerate the small stuff, right? Because many preachers have shared the story how sometimes church can split because of small stuff. I remember one uh, but Stefanos, he shared how one church split because of the women's commission. They want to have a, uh, you know, a potluck, and one wants to have nasi campur, and one wants to have one wants to have nasi goreng, and because of that, the kupu nasi campur what is kupu? <laughs> the nasi campur team and the, the, the nasi goreng team fight, and the church almost split. I mean, uh, come on, right? It's kind of funny in a way, but that's what happened. We must not exaggerate the small stuff. But today we are learning the other side. More importantly, we must not trivialize, trivialize itu mengecilkan ya, trivialize the big thing. <coughs> we must not trivialize the main thing. The main thing must become the main thing. Because if you lose the main thing, then you lose it all. If you lose the center, everything crumbles. Yang kecil jangan dibesar-besarkan, yang besar jangan dikecilkan. 
It sounds better in Indonesian. Anyway, you know, but you get the point. Uh, so you must not travel, like, trivialize the big things, and the gospel is the big thing. This is serious, that's what Paul is saying. Okay? And he's saying in verse 7, not that there, are, there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now, the word Paul used, desert, not the food, okay? <laughs> desert, it's, a, it's a, a term for a revolt. Yeah? Revolt in a military or political sense. The idea is, this is a change in religion or a change in the philosophy. So this is a serious change. In, in English, you have the word turncoat. Have you heard of that? Turncoat is in, in a war, you know, uh, opposing armies, they generally wear different uh, color, right? So that they won't shoot each other. That's called friendly fire. I mean, so they were, one is red and there is blue, for, for instance. So the, that's the term. Third code indicates that sometimes an individual, they will change side and his uniform will match the color of the former enemy. So perhaps the most famous example, a little bit of US history, is Benedict Arnold, right? He was the, uh, one of the most famous betrayal of US history is done by General Benedict Arnold. He is, he wear, he was wearing the blue coat of the American army, and then he switched or defected to the British army. The blue coat into the red coat. So that, that's, that's what's happening. That's, what, that's the, 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 the first of the word desert. And quickly, quickly desert, so quick to turn. The point is this. These agitators, or false teachers you might say, these false teachers, they have not improved the gospel, they are not modifying the gospel, they are actually switching sides, they are turncoats, they are, well, traitors. And ironically, if you see, the, what the Galatians turned to was no gospel at all, right? And turning to a different gospel, not that there is another one, there is no other gospel. See, the gospel means good, good news. What they turn to is nothing good about the news. Get it? The gospel is good news. What they turn to is nothing good about the news because the good news says it is finished. Jesus is enough. The false gospel, the agitators, quote unquote, good news says it is finished. Oh, wait, not yet. It is finished. Um, um, there's some fine prints over here, so you must, you know, you know, right? So that's what that's the, the force of the sentence. But why are the Galatians? See, this is one of the things. Why are they so quick to turn? That's the question. Why, why, why are they so quick to left their former faith? Now, I think the possible clue is in the words "trouble you" and "distort." Okay, uh, I think the NIV is better the new uh, in the, uh, international version, I think it captures the Greek better. It's actually, uh, how can, uh, there are some of you who are throwing you into confusion, uh, confusion and trying to pervert. Now, uh, maybe as, as an analogy, I'm a fan of the English Premier League. Manchester United, Falls, right? So, <laughs> uh, I've seen in a long, long my, you know, watching them play. I've seen many players switch teams. Usually, usually when they switch to uh, United or Arsenal or Chelsea and others, because they are troubled by some personal crisis, right? Not enough games. We haven't started. You know, we have, you know, we 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 don't have enough trophies. Uh, I, I have a problem with my gaffer, uh, manager, that's, that's gaffer, yeah, so that, that's how people say that. Uh, I have trouble with my manager, my, so because of that crisis, they begin to consider other teams. They want to switch teams because they have personal crisis and the other teams are saying, come on, let's just come, it's better here, come on, come on. We have trophies, we, have, we, can, we, can, we can play with Messi, you know, I don't know, I really get, and, and they are uh, wooing you coming in. See, perhaps the same condition is at play. So, this is how it works, I think. Most of the Galatians are what? Gentiles, right? Non-Jews. 
when they accepted Jesus, that means they left behind their tradition. They left behind their traditional way of life. It is highly possible that their friends, their family also has cut them off. Because everyone is worshipping Caesar, everyone is worshipping some form of God, but they say, no, I, won't. I will worship the only one true God, his name is Jesus Christ. So they will, probably they will be isolated. Maybe it's not so far from our Muslim cousins who have accepted Jesus. Maybe they'll be kind of ostracized, right? So that means these Galatians, they are in need of what? New community, right? Because, because no one will, will, will accept them there. They're, they're, they're alone, they're, they're, they need something, right? They don't have social support anymore. Maybe financial support, you know, who knows what? So they need a new community. But then when they go to the church in Galatia, you have these people saying to you, yes, we welcome you. But if you want to stay in, you got to look like us. You gotta eat what we eat. You gotta circum you gotta be circumcised. To, to, to get how that's why it's very that's why they are so quick to turn because there's a personal crisis and there is you know the, the gospel. I mean they might be saying probably they might the, the, these agitators, these false teachers, they might be saying like this. You know what? You know what? You know we're not we are not very different than Paul, your founder. I mean Paul and we we are both Jewish. We both believe that Moses. You know, the Mosaic law of scripture. We both believe in Jesus. We both believe that Gentiles can become the part of the kingdom. So we have so many similarities, they would say. But however, just one little thing. Jesus is not enough. You got to circumcision, Sabbath laws, Jewish festivals, and you gotta eat clean foods. No more pork. Oh man. Right? So, uh, so uh, that's, that's what happens. It's just a small thing, uh, and they quit to desert. See, church, the reality is, one does not wake up one morning and decide to forsake the Christian faith. It happens slowly. It happens subtly. Gak langsung tiba-tiba kita berubah. Kejadiannya itu pelan-pelan. Because it is very clear, you will know, like an alarm clock, right? If you see a big monster, you will run. <laughs> but if you see, you can't see the monster because it's small stuff, then you will just go. You don't, you don't, you don't see any danger. Right? So this is the same is happening. So the point is this: a combination of personal crisis and false teaching will get you to switch sides. So notice, examine your life. Right are you in some sort of a crisis? Are you shaken in, in areas of your life? And then look at what you are hearing. Notice what you are consuming. Are you planted in the right church? Do you have the right kind of friends? Do you study the Bible? Because if those two can be, can be very little, little, not little, it's a, it's a bahaya. But small crisis and just a little bit of false truth may, be, may get you the, to the other side, which to the other uh, 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 wrong side. So this is the danger of false gospel. But let's move on, shall we? Let's go to verse 8 now. Let's look at how does this look like, okay? Verse 8 says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel, Contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be a curse, as we have said before. So now I say again twice, he repeated, if anyone, if anyone, as if like all matters, right? If this is, is a if Paul is preaching, I can imagine, if anyone is preaching to you the gospel contrary to the one I received, let him be a curse. Paul is saying that don't mess with false teaching. Kita orang Kristen mudah setengah-setengah nanggung-nanggung tadi pagi bilang. We are Christians, we are often just you know halfway in, you know, we're not really there, right? Setengah-setengah, look warm, right? It's because a heresy, Paul is saying, will destroy you. It will affect your eternal state. Because here to be a curse, you know what to be a curse means? To be a curse means 
you are cut off from the community and you are condemned and destroyed at the judgment seat of God. Okay? Cut off from your community and condemned by God. And the curse is repeated to show that this is not some emotional verse. This is not God losing his temper. This is a careful consideration that if you, there's a line, if you cross it, you cannot go back. That's what he's saying, is it? See, after all, notice verse 9b. Notice, you have received this. You know this. You learned this in Sunday school, baby. You know about Jesus. You know about the gospel. You know about the Bible. How can you? Now, maybe some of you are thinking like this. Paul, why are you so upset, right? After all, look, what is the Galatian? What is this false teachers are giving? Just circumcision. Well, it's painful. <laughs> but they are not, they are, they are not, I mean, my point is, they are not recommending you to do something bad, right? They're just recommending some extra rules. Why are you so upset? Why do you say things like a curse? Come on, relax, man, right? You should be more tolerant. That's the word that we love here. I love the word as well. You should appreciate diversity. Yet Paul, he will not tolerate anything that would obscure the centrality of the gospel. Paulus tidak akan main-main dengan apapun yang menutupi keutamaan Injil. Paul will not tolerate anything that would obscure, hide away, yeah, obscure, uh, the centrality of the gospel. Because the gospel means good news. And, and, and in verse 4, um, it, some very brief description of the gospel. Galatians 1, verse 4 says, this is the gospel. Who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. See, this is it's saying like this. Look, the gospel is God gave Jesus. I mean, that's an act so serious. It must at least cause you to think if God can do such a big thing, I must be in really, really deep trouble, right? Just like, you know, a, yeah, yes, so, uh, the false cause, the cause is saying, here, Paul is saying, God has decisively acted in Christ, His saving work is perfect, so this, that's why the law is sidelined. But the gospel, the false gospel is saying that Jesus Christ's sacrifice is less than perfect. Now, what this means is, one of the symptoms of false gospel, false gospel, one of the symptoms is this, when we turn the good news into good advice, let me repeat that, one symptom of false gospel is when you and I turn the good news into a matter of good advice. That means, you know, people would say, to be a Christian, what does it mean? Well, to be a Christian means formerly you are a bad person, now you are a good person. Or, you are a good person, now with Christ you can be a better person. So Jesus is a moral improvement ladder. How, how can we be better? Just follow this set of rules, advice, program. See, this is the irony though. If this is Christianity, this ladder system, then, no wonder people assume all religions are the same, right? Because all religions, I mean, average people assume that religion basically teaches the same thing. Be good, seek peace, do unto others as you would have to do to you. Now, I'm not here to undermine other religions, that's another topic. I'm here to talk about Christianity. If you have to critique Christianity, you have to be sure what you are critiquing at. To, we must not, sometimes they attack the caricature of the gospel, not the real gospel. Because, because the gospel is not a, a moral ladder. A moral ladder does other religions, at least that's not how we see it. Sometimes, you know what, when we pitch Christianity, pada saat kita pitch, marketing, pada saat kita memarketing kekristenan, as the best method of personal improvement, 
complete with testimonies of how much better we are ever since we surrendered all to Jesus. Right? You have all of that, right? Well, that might be true. Well, your life can be changed because of Jesus. I would say, non-Christians, they can legitimately ask us like this. Pay attention. If everything is Christian, it's just self-improvement, then non-Christians can legitimately ask like this. So, your goal is self-improvement, right? Yes. Richer, stronger, wiser, kinder, more loving, and all of that? Yes. Well, you know what? My religion can do that too. What, what, so they would, they, they would be able to say, what, what right do you have to say that yours is the only source of happiness, meaning, exciting experience, and moral improvement? My religion have meaning, my religion have happiness, my religion have exciting experience. What right do you have? Because after all, if we are really honest and realistic, one can lose weight, stop smoking, and have better marriage, and be a nicer person without Jesus. You can! <laughs> And there have been people like that. They have good marriage, they have big houses, they are nice people, generous people, but they do not know Jesus. Okay? That's why what distinguishes Christianity at its heart, okay, at its heart, is not a moral code. That means, okay, just obey, do's and don'ts. And it, it, at its heart, is not a manual to a better life. Bible is not basic instruction before living earth. It's not. Okay? At its heart, Christianity is about a story of reality. The story of reality. It is the way it is. It is a story about a triune God. Okay? He created you and me. To glorify and enjoy Him forever. But we switch sides. We turn our courts inside to save ourselves. God, He could have cursed us. He could have destroyed us. But no, He gave us His only precious Son to save us. So we, cosmic traitors, can be welcome again as adopted sons and daughters. That's the story. That's reality. And what should and you know, and when you heard a new a news, what do you do with news? Would you say to a news, let's say, Jokowi as president? Would you then, hmm, let me think about it. Hmm. Let, let's see whether I accept him or not. That's dumb, right? And it, technically it's impossible. Because it's news, it happened, it's out there, it's reality. You cannot say, huh, I don't like that, let me just add a bit here and put a bit. No, you cannot. Faced with such news, either you accept the news or you reject the news. See, there's no halfway. That's why it's called faith. Accept the news. Faith. So that means, one of the things that we read, that means we must stop thinking life, life is about your story. If life is all about you, then you are the main character, right? You are the protagonist, right? Why is that right? <laughs> protagonist, right? And that makes God what? If you are, if, if life revolves around you, you are the main actor. Who is God? He's just another character. At best, God is the sidekick. I'm not sidekick, you know Robin has, uh, Batman has Robin. So we are like Batman, and at best, God is like Robin. Robin is not here. <laughs> the other Robin. This is the superhero of Robin. Uh, so what is the job of a sidekick? What is the, the main purpose of the sidekick? To help, right? To improve, right? To assist, to increase the main actor's chance of success, of, of defeating the enemy. <laughs> If Jesus is your sidekick, that means his main role might then be a consultant, a life coach. He might be a moral example. He might be your best bud. But he is not, definitely not your savior. Because sidekick usually don't save the main actor. He's just there, right? To help out when things go bad. But Jesus is savior. 
the reality is life is about his story. That's why it's called history, right? People say that. His, story, his story, everything revolves around God. You and I are the characters. And if you see all the movies, all the books, you have you will know that the happy characters, the one who end up well, is the one who get along with the story, right? Not make up his own story. But you see the story by faith. As by Jacob, I think he used to say, you don't use God to advance your life. You use your life to advance God's plan. And he did that. You don't use God to advance your life. Jangan menggunakan Tuhan untuk memajukan hidupmu. You use your life to advance God's plan. Engkau menggunakan hidupmu untuk memajukan rencana kehendak dan kerajaan Allah. So that's one symptom: turning good advice into uh, good news into good uh, good advice. Now, and it's here if you, you you will see right that the issue that Paul is you know screaming at us is about the content, right? The purity of the gospel, not the <coughs> reputation or the ability of the, the messenger. That's why when Paul says in verse um, 8, even if an angel from heaven preach something to you differently, you have to, the, the angel is accursed. This is what Luther, I like, I, 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 I think this is the best way to put it. Martin Luther put it like this. He says, that which does not teach Christ is not apostolic. Apostolic means, apa ya? according to the teaching of the apostles, the, the, the true gospel, okay? That which does not teach is not teach Christ is not apostolic, even if Peter and Paul be the teachers. However, on the other end, that which does teach Christ is apostolic, even if Judas, Annas, Pilate, or Herod should Profound him. Okay? What he's saying is, even if Peter or Paul preach something else, you must not hear them. If Herod or Judas preach the gospel, you have to hear them. <laughs> it's about the content, not the uh, messenger. And one symptom, another symptom, I don't have to, don't worry, I don't have 22. <laughs> Besides turning the good news into good advice, another symptom of God's gospel is when Christians say that doctrine does not matter and all that matters is love and unity. I think it's a symptom of uh, I think I think it's a symptom of false gospel. When Christians start to say doctrines don't matter, doctrines justified, all we need is love, as the people said. We must embrace anyone. We must accept everyone. You see, because, because let, let's think about it. If, it, it. It's connected to the first point. If the gospel, if Christianity is just about ethics, right? How to be better, then everyone is doing that. Of course we should embrace them, right? The goal is the same. Everyone seeks peace. Everyone seeks a better society. But the gospel is not about moral betterment. Not about personal improvement. And, and I, I think all you need is not love. There's a movie, a kind of like movie. It's called What If. So the story goes like this. After there's two uh, couples, and after they watch a, a romantic movie together, Wallace, that's the uh, main actor, played by Daniel Radcliffe, that's the Harry Potter guy, uh, Harry, okay. Uh, he, he's, after they watch a romantic movie, the cynical Harry the, uh, says, you know, I don't believe that love makes you a good person. I believe love makes you a worse person. Whoa. Kind of good back for, for a date. It's like, a, okay, that's a cool way to say it. And then the, the, the guy, the, the, the girl, Chantry, she was shocked. How can you believe that? How can you believe that love makes you a worse person? Look at the fairy tale. Look at all the love, all the brave love. And then this is what Wallace says. I, I kind of like this. If you can read that. Wallace says, uh, in fairy tales, love inspires you to be noble and courageous. But in real life, Love is just an all-purpose excuse for selfish behavior. 
you can lie and cheat and hurt people and it's all okay because you are in it's quite cynical but it's not wrong <laughs> right I think it's very realistic that's what it's saying I think Sometimes, yeah, because, you know, I can, it's okay, I, I, why do you leave your wife? Because I love them. I love, I, because I love my, the other women. <coughs> so all in the name of love, everything's excused. Be careful. That means if you do believe that love is everything, you cannot send robbers to jail. Because they can just say, I love money so much. Oh, okay, off you go. It's ridiculous, right? <laughs> That's ridiculous, you can't do that. Deep down, we know instinctively something else must be more important than love. But you say, God is love, God is love, First John, yes, true, God is love, but love is not God. Smoji. Okay? God is love, but love is not God. And by the way, have you read the verses surrounding the, the, that says God is love? This is the surrounding verses. Let me read three, okay? The one that says God is love. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know, to believe, and uh, the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love, by this is love perfected in us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because he is, so also we are in this world. Now, I don't have time to unpack that, but clearly you can just look at the words here. Clearly, at least it teaches us love does not stand alone, right? It needs truth. And a very specific confession of that. Confess what? Jesus is the Son of God. If not, judgment will come. <clears throat> See? The gospel is not God loves everyone, let's all be best friends. That's not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus died while we are still his enemies, not friends. That's the gospel. Finally, that's the uh, false, uh, danger of false gospel, the symptom of false, false gospel, and what is the cure? Let's look at verse 10. Galatians 1 verse 10 says, For am I now seeking the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant. Well, technically it's a slave. It's more, more uh, accurate. Uh, do loss, slave of Christ. So, um, it's quite an irony here. The false teachers, they're actually accusing Paul for teaching false gospel. It works like this. They would say, you must not believe Paul. He's saying it's wrong. Why? He's teaching you to just have faith. You don't need to do anything. That's wrong. See? You know why he said all that? You know why he just said faith alone? So that you'll be popular. So that you will like him. So that you will believe in him. But no, it's false. You must not believe in him. He's offering you an easy life. Just believe and live. That's wrong. You must live and do. So they, you, you, you get how they you kind of switch that? Um, so, the, so, so the false gospel, they see themselves as if they are cleaning up Paul's mess. See, now I have to come and I have to fix this, you know. There's some fine prints you can just sign. You know? Some fine prints, you have to read the fine prints. But obviously, Paul is saying that, no, I'm not speaking the gospel to, to get popularity. I'm speaking the gospel because I am I cannot help it. I am the slave of Christ. This is a, a, a message translation, kind of like how Eugene Peterson puts it. it. Says, "Do you think I speak this strongly in order to manipulate crowds, or curry favor with God, or get popular applause? If my goal was popularity, I would not being I would bother being Christ's slave." Um, so, um, so Paul is saying, if if you know, if you want to be popular, then you know, preach Christ, preach everything but Christ crucified. If you want to be popular, don't preach the cross. It's it's it's, it's dangerous to preach the cross. It's offensive to preach the scandal of the gospel. 
Paul is saying, no, 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 because I said it strongly, because, because I am a slave of Christ. Christ compels me. The news pulls me out. I cannot just say what you want me to say. I have to say what God has given me. What I have seen in the cross, in the resurrection. So the cure to false gospel is to return. To return to the scandal of the cross. To marvel at Christ crucified, not humanity improved. Let me repeat that. The cure to false gospel is to marvel again at Christ crucified and risen and ascend, ascended, not to marvel at humanity improved. See, um, let me share a bit. You know, being a pastor, uh, local pastor, is much, I think, uh, more difficult than being a speaker or a lecturer. Because as a pastor, you, you, gotta, you gotta have something fresh every week, right? Well, unless it's a big church and every day you have different speakers, then that's different. But you know, my experience for the past, oh, I don't know, five years, I've been oh, I've been preaching almost weekly. And and for, for especially in the local church, you, you can't preach the same thing, right? I mean, I mean, I, next week I cannot say, okay, let's talk about uh, the angel of false god. No, what's not? <laughs> you, you don't know about that, right? I have to come up every day with something new, a wonderful <clears throat> insight, a moving illustration, right? A clear outline. Just like today, it's a bad occurrence for me. <laughs> Something I don't have an outline at all. A compelling argument, and apparently a lot of good jokes, which I am very bad at. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, 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 and often, you know, when I don't have all of those things, insights, illustrations, you know, all of those, I, I feel like I'm just, I'm no good. I'm, I'm less than a preacher. I, I'm stressed out on, on Saturdays. And, and I know, I know, I know I'm not a very smart. I also know that I'm not very spiritual, I you know. But see, ever since I knew Christ and I learned about Him, and I, you know, my standard of success is very simple as a preacher, as a pastor. Very simple. Every time I get up, every time I prepare, my standard of success is simply this. Three words. Preach the text. That's it. If I preach the text, I'm all right. Because I believe, at least in all my limited years of preaching, just like they say, all roads lead, lead to Rome, all texts lead to Christ. You preach this properly, it will lead you to Christ. Or at least it should lead you to Jesus. It should highlight who He is, what He has done. So that's my, my stand is just preach the text. Even if I'm not had to have all of that. Charles Spurgeon says, A sermon without Christ in it is like a loaf of bread without any flour. Seperti roti yang tanpa apa flour itu? Kaki. Tepung. Roti tanpa tepung. He says, A sermon without Christ is like a brook without water, a cloud without rain, a well, sumurnya, which mocks the traveler, a tree twice dead, plucked up by the root, a sky without a sun, a night without a star. Very pretty. It is a realm of death, a place where angels mourn and the devils laugh. That's the sermon without Christ. And this is a you know, very uh, famous quote from him. A sermon without Christ, as its beginning, middle, and end, is a mistake in conception and crime in execution. However grand language, it will be merely much to do about nothing if Christ be not there. And this is the most important part. And I mean by Christ, not merely his example, not merely his ethical precepts of his teaching, meaning the, the goals and the laws and all of so forth. When I mean you preach Christ, I mean you preach His atoning blood, His wondrous satisfaction made for human sin, and the grand doctrine of what? Belief and That's Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers. <coughs> now, let me say clearly, there is no excuse for boring preaching, okay? <laughs> I mean, my preaching professor used to say, Thou shalt not be boring. 
It's a little different commandment apparently. And one of the ways you know how you are, you are preaching well is when you preach an hour and it feels like 10 minutes. Uh, bad preaching is when you preach 10 minutes and it feels like an hour. That's bad preaching. Okay, so <laughs> I hope when I preach an hour it feels like 10 minutes. The point is there is no excuse for bad preaching. There is no excuse for poorly organized preaching, confusing, difficult to understand. But we live in an entertainment driven culture, right? Since we are infancy, maybe, we live, we have been trained to evaluate things by how they make us feel. I feel good, so this teaching must be good. I am entertained, so this guy must be saying the right things. So you judge things based on how you feel because you are living in entertainment culture. Very dangerous. So I'm saying to you with all, hopefully with all humility and love, if you want to be entertained, go to a movie. <laughs> Don't come to church. Because here you, are to, you, are, you come here to worship. You come here to give thanks to God. You come here not to be entertained. You come to be evaluated, in fact. Not to be entertained. If you are entertained, church is good. But the main point is not the bad. Okay? But to be evaluated, God, am I right with you? Have I been living right to you, your precepts and laws and all of that? If you want to feel good, get a massage. I mean, you know, a lot of things can make you feel good. But don't expect that God will do everything you say. After all, a God who does everything you want, a God who satisfies all your needs, is not a God at all. It's just an illusion, I think. That's why at the end of the day, the old hymn says it best. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Jesus is our solid rock and other grounds, other foundations sinking temporarily, uh, giving you illusion. That's all.